So uh, I hope you'll let me start with a, uh, a little bit of an introduction. First of all, there are a lot of students here who are with me in a couple of classes. And I want to just uh, say a word uh, to them, if you don't mind, because they have to turn in a, uh, a summary tomorrow morning <laughs> or tomorrow afternoon. So I want to let you guys know that it's due tomorrow. Um, it's not, you can't turn it in on Thursday. Um, so, um, and, and I wanted, and I also want to tell you that um, we have some exciting things that are going to go on this, this quarter. We have five events, and this is just the beginning with uh, Professor Mark Dollinger. Um, we have two extraordinary Jewish authors, writers, who are coming um, at the uh, end of January and the beginning of February. First, uh, Kenneth Bonnert, who has written an extraordinary novel uh, entitled The Lion Seeker. And then that is followed by uh, Rachel Kadish um, and her book, The Weight of Ink. And then this event that we've been working on, <laughs> I've, been, I've been hoping for this thing for 10 years. It's called The Three Cantors. We have three cantors plus an organist who are going to perform cantorial music for us from the diversity of the Jewish tradition on the 24th of February in Congregation B'nai B'rith. And then we're ending this quarter with a, um, a fifth event, which will be Eddie Portnoy talking about the Yiddish press and how it contributed to the formation of American Jewry. Um, uh, it, it's a great pleasure to introduce you to Mark Dollinger. And, we have his most recent book, which is entitled Black Power in uh, Jewish Politics, uh, Reinventing the Alliance in the 1960s. Uh, he is our speaker tonight. You have a great deal, I think, of information in the program about him. He is a professor of history, uh, has a chair in Jewish studies at uh, San Francisco State University. Uh, he's widely known for his work on American Jewish history, um, and especially, I first uh, heard him speak and read his work with uh, regards to the Jews of the Western, uh, of the West, I think, and uh, he's been a long time uh, commentator on uh, Jews in, in the Western United States, and I think you're gonna find this discussion tonight very interesting. Uh, our friends at Chaucer's uh, have copies of this, uh, and I think it's a book that you'll want to buy uh, to add to your Jewish uh, studies uh, library at home uh, because the argument that he makes is absolutely fascinating. And we will only be able to hear a small portion of it in his presentation tonight. So you'll want to read uh, this book, Black Power, Jewish Politics, Reinventing the Alliance in the 1960s. So will you welcome now uh, Professor Mark Dollinger. It was 1972. That's my classic 1970s artwork. I uh, lived in the almost all white suburbs of Los Angeles, and since we're kind of in Southern California, for those of you who have come north to, to UCSB. I lived in, uh, in Palos Verdes, California, which is what you see right here. And uh, I think I'm a little bit safer um, offering you the next slide uh, here than I am up north. And I'll just say in 1972, the Los Angeles Lakers had just won their very first national championship. And uh, Wilt Chamberlain, who still has the record for most number of points in a single game at 100, that was before the three-point shot. Not that Wilt was ever taking three-pointers to begin with. And uh, they played basketball at Inglewood's Fabulous Forum. And I'm told it's still around, but they're just using it as a concert venue now because the Lakers have moved over to, to Staples. Well, I'm here to uh, remind everyone that the uh, Lakers were not the only basketball team to play in the fabulous forum. All right. When I was in third grade, my mom took my brother and I 
to the forum for another basketball game. This is not a third grade picture of me, but I love the picture. I love my brother, I love my mom. That's taken actually in Manhattan. So I just wanted to put that up there for a moment before I explain that uh, we saw the Harlem Globetrotters play. And uh, it was fantastic. The uh, skill and antics of, well, this was the era, if any of you remember the Globetrotters of the 70s, um, of Meadowlark Lemon, Fred Curly Neal, and uh, what maybe the Harlem Globetrotters didn't understand was that uh, they actually offered me a course direction for life. I loved it so much that after the game, I made a proclamation to my mom. When I grow up, I'm going to be a Harlem Globetrotter. <laughs> oh, the laughter is so painful. <laughs> You're re-triggering a childhood trauma. Because, crushing my spirit, my mom replied, no, you're not. <laughs> and I said, why not, mom? And she said, because you have to be black to be a Harlem Globetrotter. And at that moment, I learned that I was white, that the Globetrotters were black, and that it meant something. Well, apparently, I was a, a very slow learner growing up, and uh, this is Temple Beth El, uh, San Pedro, California. It's the synagogue and religious school where I grew up, and raised in the religious school classrooms of the 1970s in Judaism's reform movement, I learned three basic lessons in the curriculum. Number one, the Holocaust was terrible. Number two, Israel was wonderful. And part of that was the Jewish National Fund, Trees in Israel campaign. There might be people here who, who remember the campaign. Uh, it was uh, two and a half dollars. They would give you a cardboard you know, thing and you'd fit 10 quarters in it. And when you got the 10th quarter, you'd bring it in and, uh, and they would buy for you a tree in Israel, and then they would say to you, you, know, you want to go to Israel to visit your tree? And uh, all right, on the theme of childhood trauma, two of them, I walked into the synagogue office one day and found my tree certificate in the secretary's typewriter. We had typewriters then, just so you know. That's where you used to type things out, which told me that it actually wasn't coming to, from Israel. And then I learned that you actually needed to buy 10,000 trees before they actually put up a big plaque for you in Israel to go and, and visit it. Well, we also learned about uh, how Jews were engaged in the fight for social justice. And this is the most famous picture of the uh, Black Jewish Alliance of the Civil Rights Movement. It's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching in Selma. And uh, Anytime anyone wants to write a book on black Jewish relations, that's what they want on the cover. And for reasons you'll hear in a moment, um, that's not on my cover. So translating all of that to education, um, I arrived on the campus of Cal Berkeley in the fall of 1982. And uh, well, Rabbi Goodman is here. And you came in the fall of 83, I believe, because you're a year behind me. I came in the fall of 82. And uh, I was ready to change the world. Uh, here, yeah, there, there's a beautiful picture from the, from the Berkeley campus across the bay. Uh, this is where Mario Savio uh, changed the world with the free speech movement. And um, this is famous Sprawl Plaza in the center of campus. And along its famed walkway, various student groups, they called it tabling. So they set up a table at lunch. They'd put all their flyers on the table, and then you'd walk by, you'd pick up you know, whatever information from whatever clubs you wanted. So clearly, you know, I went to the, uh, to the Hill, I'll pitch Hillel, because we're in the Hillel house. I went to the Hillel table, which at Berkeley was called the Jewish Student Board. And, and I signed up, because that's the first place to go. And then I went to, the, of course, the second place to go, the African Student Union, because I was interested in black-Jewish relations. So I, uh, I introduced myself to, uh, to my classmate, um, and smiling, I said to him, let's start a black Jewish dialogue. And uh, he burst out laughing. And then he laughed some more. And then I have to believe at a certain moment, he, he saw the shock and the horror and the embarrassment on my face. And with, I think, compassion, he did all he did, could do to control himself. 
And to kind of ease a really awkward moment, he smiled and he said the following words. Hey, I'm from Harlem. Now, I think he assumed that I knew what it meant when he said, hey, I'm from Harlem. And, and on one level, I knew what that meant because I, I knew that Harlem um, was and is an African-American neighborhood in, in upper Manhattan. But on another level, I knew when he said that, that it meant a whole lot more. The Black Student Union's reference, uh, student members' reference to the Manhattan neighborhoods was more than just a geographic reference. It communicated and reflected two generations of a divide between the African American and Jewish communities that followed the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the Voting Rights Act in 65, and, and then, the, then the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Blacks from New York, I understood quickly, did not see the social justice world through the same lens as white Jewish liberals. In a gesture of kindness, my, Har my Harlem interlocutor offered to pitch my, my request for a black Jewish dialogue to members of his group, um, even as he let me know that he didn't think that uh, anyone was going to be interested in that. And uh, thanks for the offer, I said to him, but there's no need for you to make the pitch. That ended the Cal Berkeley Black Jewish Student Alliance. And it began this book. Good evening. It's great to be here. It's great to be at UC Santa Barbara and Hillel. And, uh, and I just thank Professor and, and Rabbi and, and everyone for, and they for welcoming, me, welcoming me here today. So uh, today's talk is about three things. And now we're going to go to a pop quiz. And since I know a lot of you are here because you're enrolled in classes, we will see how they do you know, on the pop quiz. Uh, some of you I met with for lunch. Uh, you, are, you cannot give the answer because you know it already, and nor can you whisper it to a friend that's a violation of the Dollinger Honor Code. Uh, so, and don't shout it out. Raise your hand so we can call on you and recognize you. And I'll let you know this is the easy question. Anyone like to offer a definition of the word history? OK, that would be the easy one. Anyone? Oh, who said that? Yeah, raise your hand. Thank you. And what's your name? Hi, Lisa. What, what would you say? The West. The, well done. Study of the past. Thank you. And now may you inspire somebody to think about the more difficult word. It's pronounced historiography. Any English majors here? You can look at the etymology of this word. Any history majors, you might have actually studied it in your classes. Anybody on historiography? Please. What's your name? Aaron. Aaron, thank you. Well done. How did you know that? You're just smart. Yeah, you looked at that word, and it's like, that's great. So thank you. Uh, I'll bring everyone to catch up with you right now. Do you see the word graph in the word? To graph is to write. That's correct. It's to write. So it's a history of historical writing. Oh, one of Rabbi Goodman's former professors. Why use a monosyllabic when a polysyllabic will do? I just try to use that theme as I talk. So historiography is the study of how historians study the past. And the best example of this would be, let's assume you're a white student at the University of Mississippi in 1840. And you're taking the US History Survey, and the textbook is going to be published by the University of Mississippi Press. What's it going to say about slavery? It's a good thing, right? You're a white student in Mississippi in 1840. They actually called it a positive good. And there were actually seven historical arguments to defend slavery when you were in the Deep South. Well, let's put you 20 years later, 1860, University of Massachusetts, Boston with a book from the University of Massachusetts Press, open to the chapter on slavery, what's it going to say about slavery, do you think? Abomination. An abomination. That's right, because Boston was the center of the abolitionist movement. All right, just for fun, you don't know anything about anything? Put those two textbooks side by side. You can read both chapters, and you'd never know it's the same historical event. So academic historians do not actually write history. They write historiography, which is to say someone's going to write a book about something, and 20 years later, a new grad student's going to come through, 
and they're going to reread the sources or find new sources, and they're going to bring their own generational perspective to the question. So tonight is not the history of black Jewish relations and black power in Jewish politics, it's historiography. I'm going to talk about the way in which this has been understood in the past and why, of course, I think it's wrong and then offer a new, a new idea. Um, but in the theory of the polysyballic, I would like to share with you my favorite polysyballic. Yes, there it is, filio pietistic. Anyone? I'll give you a hint. It's from the Latin. <laughs> you got, oh, we have, yes, please. I'm already impressed. Well done. How did you know that? You, you're, were you like an English major? Or you, that's because nobody gets that one. That's excellent. Italian. Italian. All right, everybody, especially undergrads who are here. Uh, so, you know, shame on everyone now, right? Filio pietistic, literally love of one's own brother. Actually, it means ethnic self congratulations. And for tonight, it means aren't the Jews great? You see, here's how it goes. In ethnic studies, regardless of, of you know, black studies, Jewish studies, women's studies, LGBT studies, just go through any of them, uh, the first generation of historical writing tends to be self-congratulatory. All the great contributions that whatever group you're writing about made to society, and you can call that filiopietistic or filiopietism to be impressive. So in Jewish studies, the first generations of books in Jewish studies were, were all claiming how great the Jews were. And then if you're a grad student, all the books say that, and now you've got to get a PhD and get a book contract and get a job and get tenure, what are you going to say about the Jews? The Jews suck, right? Because you've got to go the opposite of what it was, and you're going to find books that say the negative, and then the next generation's going to, well, they're going to say, no, stop fighting back and forth. The truth is somewhere in the middle. And then the fourth generation is going to say, oh, you're asking the wrong questions. It's really about transnational environmentalism. And then they're going to start the whole process um, all over again. So uh, here's a challenge. And professor, for your students, you can, you can be the judge of the challenge. For you to use the phrase filiopietistic historiographic analysis in conversation. Now, you can't say, hey, you know, you went in here to lecture and you learned about filiopietistic historiographic analysis, that would be too easy. You have to have an ongoing conversation for which the phrase filiopietistic historiographic analysis naturally occurs. Tell your professor the story, and professor, I'll send him a prize if you let me know. Um, that would be great. Oh, OK, so ethnic self-congratulation of, or lo literally love of one's own family. We have history. We have historiography. And we have historical memory. Historical memory is fascinating. It is what we remember about what happened in the past, even if that's not what really happened at all. It's astounding how we can create, or what's called invent, a history that didn't really exist. So I need to, uh, I need to own, own a little bit of, of this right now uh, and talk about the rules of academic history. If you're a history professor, and you're trained in grad school and you go out to write books, um, you are told that the art of writing history is about putting yourself in a time and a place that's different from your own and then describing it. So that if you all are to read a really good history book, you would get to feel like you've been transported to that place. And uh, for that reason, historians take what's called a third person detached critical approach to their subject, which is a fancy way of saying you don't talk about yourself in your book. And if you do a good job describing history, the reader will feel as if they've moved in time and in place. We are trained so well that we can capture history no matter what subject we're studying. Now, I picked 20th century US history, and I picked politics, and I picked American Jewish history, you know, and, uh, and that's somewhat problematic because there are actually people in this room here tonight who were um, aware of the 1960s, who were engaged and were politically active, and I am here now in a younger generation about to tell them about their life, whether it's true or not. I'll just set that up for myself right now. Um, 
one of my colleagues at San Francisco State, Professor Fred Astrin. He's a scholar of the medieval period. He does not have to worry that when he gives a public lecture, he is going to have people who lived in that time yelling at him. I told him, you get a free pass, and I never get a free pass when I go out, when I go out and write. Well, something happened with this book, you see. The first two words of the title are black power. And as it turns out, uh, I'm a white man. How can a white man write a book on black power? Well, technically, traditionally, it shouldn't matter. If you're a good historian, you'll be able to write it. But as many of my colleagues and African-American uh, African colleagues in African-American history have told me, their blackness is on every word they write. And they remind me that my whiteness is on every word that I write, too, even if uh, I have the privilege of not having to say it. So I gave a call to my editor. And I said, I need to break the first rule of academic historians. I need to insert myself into my own narrative. There's already an introduction. So I said, I want to write a preface. And the preface is going to be some embarrassing, self-deprecating stories of what it was like to be raised as a white middle class Jewish kid in the suburbs of LA, going to the Harlem Globetrotters game, showing up on your first day of college, and getting a pretty quick education about how much you missed growing up. So, um, so that's why I opened with those self-deprecating stories, and that's why I share that with you, because I think that's actually relevant to the historiography and to, uh, and to how you read. This may appear to you to be the letter Y, but no, it's actually far more complex. That, I dare say, is a visual representation of the filiopietistic historiographic analysis plaguing the literature on black Jewish relations. What do you think? Yeah? All right, I'll explain. Imagine, with the letter Y, that you have African Americans on the top left part of the Y. You have Jewish Americans on the top right part of the Y. And do you see how they're separate? But something happens over time, and they come together. And when they come together, right here in the center, we have now the Black Jewish Alliance of the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and early 1960s. And look how beautiful it is. They're marching together over time. And then we're done. Wait, let me check my notes. Wow, look, it's wrong. It doesn't matter which book you read in the first historiographic generation of writing in the filiopietistic school of thought, because that's what the thesis was. Whether it was a community study or a big study or a biography or, whatever, or however that goes, it always, it always ends up that way. And so on my, on, on, on my first book, actually, I challenged the letter Y with, yes, the letter X. If you can figure out how this thing goes. Blacks and Jews are at the top. They come together about 1954, Brown decision. Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks. And then somewhere around 64 or 65 with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, they're continuing into a different place. So today in the 21st century, for the most part, the African American and Jewish American uh, uh, communities are separate. So if the first historiographic school was the Y, and the second one was the X, the big dramatic question is, what's next? I'm not going to give you the letter I picked until later. You know, that's going to be sort of the dramatic thing to, 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 to talk about. So hold on tight. As it turns out, black Jewish relations was not what many folks probably think that it was. Almost all the writings that have been done have been quite filiopietistic. So here are my central questions for this study and for you today. How can we understand American Jews and social justice? How much Jewishness is really Jewish? Or to be honest, how much Jewishness is actually Americanness, but Jews don't realize that. And how much did Jews lead and how much did they follow? So I want to open by saying, by the way, because this is important now, the book is called Black Power, Jewish Politics. It's actually not a book on black power. It's actually a book on Jewish politics because I'm trained in American Jewish history, and I'm interested in understanding how Jews went through the 60s. I studied, started to study the black power movement, and I was fascinated to see how um, American Jews and Jewish organizational leaders 
looked at black power, and I thought by examining Jews through that lens, I was going to show things about Jews that, that folks hadn't seen before. So with, um, okay, with that, we're going to have a little, uh, no, it's going to be a test for everybody. Here's how it's going to go. I'm told we have to be out by midnight. So we're going to put you in groups of two or three. I know, you know, just look around, get two or three people in a group, and you're all going to get a text. And the text, well, so there's two problems. There's three problems with the text. The first problem, it's going to be a quote. And the first problem is, I took away the person who said the quote, so you won't know. Second, I took away the year the quote was written. Third, I did this with some Jewish studies graduate students, and they were so smart because they knew that African Americans are called by different sorts of names in different historical periods, Afro-American, African American, black, Negro. So I changed up all of those names. So don't think that when you read what name it is that it has any indication of the year. Some of you won't get a quote. You're just going to get a direct question. So if you get one and it's just a question, just answer the question. So we're going to pass around the quotes. And your job is to determine who said it and when. You don't have to know the name of the person who said it. You could have the type of person who would say something like that from the 60s. So, uh, Rabbi, can we have distribute these here? Great. So okay, uh, give me some. I'll, we'll, we'll do one on each side. Uh, I, will, I will circulate uh, and, uh, and help you if you need some help. Uh, but otherwise, get you know three people to a group. Two is fine. Four might be pushing it. Here we go. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. If I could have your attention, even if you're not done yet, even if you're not done, because we have so many people, we're clearly not going to, sorry, not everyone's going to have a chance to speak. Um, so we'll take at least one, one group that has it, maybe a second one. And, uh, and because you all have, there's, I think there's like 10 different quotes in there, uh, I'm going to put it up on the screen. I'll read it to you if you have trouble, you know, reading the screen. But quote number one, or text number one, raise your hand if you have text number one, just so we can see where you're at. Okay, it looks like we have three or four groups that have text number one. It says, black power stresses black initiative, black self-worth, black identity, black pride. Black power seeks the growth and development of black economic and political power. It seeks black leadership development, strives for a form of separation, which will permit it to achieve those goals, and then re-enter into coalition with whites as psychological, social, and political equals. So the question we have is, who said it, or what kind of person would say it, and when would they say it? So would somebody who had that text want to give us uh, your thinking, please? Oh, actually, I think we have a mic here that needs to come to you, because we're, we're on TV, so. OK, here is the mic. Are we on? So we'll get this on. We think it might be Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Excellent answer. And why do you think it could be Malcolm X? Because he looks forward to the development, the empowerment, and everything of black people, but separate from whites. This is what I love to call the correct, incorrect answer. Well done. Thank you. That's the answer I wanted, because I wanted the wrong answer. Because. That is absolutely a Malcolm X quote. And if you were in the archives doing the research, reading the first historiographic generation, that's got to be from Malcolm. And it turns out it's from the American Jewish Committee in 1969. And for those who are not familiar with the American Jewish Committee, it is a right-leaning national Jewish organization, pretty much the last Jewish organization on earth you would think would have nice things to say about the black power movement. Thank you so much for benefiting us with the wrong answer. Um, which groups have text number two? Please, what can you, uh, oh, so let me uh, read it. OK, so this is not a text. It's a direct question. What is the position of the Anti-Defamation League on the Nation of Islam? Just to let you know, the Anti-Defamation League is the nation's leading Jewish organization to fight anti-Semitism. And the Nation of Islam you're probably familiar with now because um, uh, Louis Farrakhan is in the news a lot with the Women's March and things like that. So how would the, the number one group to fight anti-Semitism feel about the nation? What did y'all think? 
You had, did, you have, did you have that quote? No. Who had number two? Who had question number two? Nobody? No. Statistics demand somebody got number two. <laughs> All right, I'll open it to the group. What do you think the, the Anti-Defamation League has to say about the Nation of Islam? What? How, how, would, how would they approve it? Or why would they approve it? Because they represent... Oh, let's get a mic here, yeah. Because they represent everybody's rights. And, uh, 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 well, and, the, and they're looking for peace. They're All not right. looking for... Thank you. That is a lovely, optimistic answer, <laughs> right? Because, but here's the deal. The Nation of Islam is anti-Semitic. The Anti-Defamation League fights anti-Semitism. The answer is easy. How does the ADL feel about the Nation of Islam? They don't like it, which means you are absolutely right, because that's the correct, incorrect answer they just gave. And you gave the correct answer, which is, oh my gosh. Can you, the Anti-Defamation League, which right now is in the lead fighting against Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, and this quote, right, so in 1959, Time Magazine put Elijah Muhammad on the cover. So he's all over the country. And he was described as anti-white, anti-Semitic, anti-woman. You know, it was a very unflattering article on the leader of the Nation of Islam. And the head of the, of the ADL sent a secret confidential memo to each of his regional offices that said, Time Magazine notwithstanding, we have no documentable evidence of anti-Semitism on the part of the Temples of Islam movement or Elijah Muhammad. That is stunning. What I love mostly about that text when I found it in the archives, it said on it, top secret, not for publication. And I'm like, no, I got to publish this. This is good stuff. So I called my doctoral advisor. I said, do I have to follow that? And since it was put on by the ADL and not by the archive, I was allowed to publish it, which now brings up a challenging historiographic question. On what planet does the ADL send out a secret memo telling all of the people that an anti-Semitic organization isn't in fact anti-Semitic? And for Jewish leaders today who are very, very upset with the ADL, with the, with the Nation of Islam, calling it anti-Semitic, I think they'd be stunned to see um, how it was before. Who has text three? Please, thank you for raising your hand. Tell us, um, oh, the, the, oh, so now the, it's a similar question. This is the American Jewish Committee, another national Jewish self-defense organization. And now I have to invoke the honor code. We have had enough of these quotes that you may be sensing a pattern developing. You are not allowed to change the answer you originally had because you think you know where this is going. You have to give us the original answer and we'll go from there. So please, what do, what do you think? I think the position was not good. It has to be not good because that's the correct, incorrect answer. And uh, well, okay, so let me, let me back this up and then, we'll, and then I'll tell you the story. Uh, there was a rumor that Elijah Muhammad was going to give a speech in New Jersey in a place described as a metropolis in northern New Jersey. Let's call it Newark, shall we? <laughs> and uh, the Jewish organization wanted to send an undercover secret person to surveil Elijah Muhammad to see if he was a threat and if African Americans were going to be you know, moving with him. So there were no black Jews in that organization and no white Jew is going to show up for Elijah Muhammad with a notepad, you know. So they went to the city of Newark, this Jewish organization, and they went to the Human Rights Commission of the city. They found an African-American man, and he went in for the two-and-a-half-hour speech and took notes and reported back to the city of Newark and to the Jewish organization. So I'm just saying, if you want to think about how the government surveils radical thinkers, or you want to think in which private organizations in alignment with public authorities in order to surveil radical thinkers. This is kind of a, a troubling indication. So the report came back that he gave a rambling two and a half hour speech, including the accusation that Jews killed Jesus Christ, which by the way, is the biggest anti-Semitic trope you can say. And uh, with that, in 1959, the American Jewish Committee 
was more concerned with the anti-white statements of Elijah Muhammad, and they publicly stated he was not anti-Semitic. This is vexing. When you're sitting in the archives and reading this, first, you know, everything they wrote before is wrong, and second, something's going on deeper here that's going to explain this. So who has text four? Oh, please, let us know. Oh, okay, hold on. Over here, please. Well, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let you comment as well. But what, what, so, so text four. Oh, I'll, I'll read it, and then you tell us what you thought, and then we'll get to you guys after that. When 38 black Muslims were jailed in Lorton, Virginia, they were, quote, forbidden to wear medals symbolic of their faith even though that privilege was accorded to Catholics and Baptists and others. What would you think the response of the organized Jewish community would be when a bunch of anti-Semitic black Muslims in jail were told they couldn't wear the right clothes? Please. They would defend them. They, they would defend them. On, right. on what grounds would they defend them? Uh, religious freedom. Well, Professor, well, I'm going to hold off on that right yeah. now. What did you guys think? Uh, I changed up. I know. The Mexico City Black Power salute yeah, from 68, yeah. All right. I'm only disappointed because you both have the correct, correct answer. I want the correct, incorrect answer, right? Because Jewish leaders are not supposed to be concerned about the religious freedom rights of black Muslims in jail. It turns out they really were. Um, and uh, Shad Polier of the American Jewish Congress here with Dr. King wrote a letter to the prison warden to say, religious freedom applies to everyone, even black Muslims, and even in jail. And I will just say that 10 years later, or 20 years later, or in 2019, I don't think you're going to find leaderships of these organizations writing letters to uh, prison wardens trying to advocate you know, for, for the rights uh, of those communities. Who has text five? So who has text five? I'm guessing you're probably a little farther in the back. Please, thank you for your bravery. Text five. The long-standing African-American distrust of white people, born of oppression, is manifesting itself in a growing spirit of go it alone. Blacks were already reevaluating their alliances and had come to know their strength in the political and economic arenas. This person that we're going to try to identify predicted a period of mutual irritation and misunderstanding, followed by a spike in new and more active forms of black anti-Semitism. Who or what kind of person would have said it and when? So we were split between Jesse Jackson and Malcolm X. Jesse Jackson or Malcolm X, I'm loving both of those correct, incorrect answers, <laughs> because it was Nathan Edelstein of the Anti-Defamation League in 1960. And here's the significance of both of those facts. First, it's the ADL. The Anti-Defamation League is on to black power at a time that the earlier historical writing would seem to believe that, that it was like a big shock in 1964 and 65 when Stokely Carmichael got more militant and black anti-Semitism and whites were purged from leadership. That, the early historical writing said, oh my goodness, what a sh we can't believe that happened. And now we're finding out that national Jewish organizations, and I'll say senior white men even, are writing, and this is actually a published thing, um, and here's the key, 1960, four or five years before the black power movement even picked up, Jewish leaders were predicting that it would happen. Which means, oh good, I, got, I have something called a wow-o-meter. You know, like when I say something, oh wow, that's interesting to think about. It means that the historiography cannot argue that black power was a surprise to Jews or that the reaction of Jews um, would therefore be that it was you know, black power's fault. Who has text six? Oh yeah, please, thank you. Uh, I'll read it and then you talk to us about it. All right, listen up for this one. A segregated school, a segregated system, this is school, but a segregated system is not merely an unfair system, but it is a wasteful and inefficient system. Nevertheless, we do not believe a federal law to equalize educational opportunities by public subsidy should be used as a means to attack the segregated school system. 
so long as the law guarantees that states having segregated schools do not discriminate financially against children in minority schools, we believe the bill should be supported. So what did you think about that one? Uh, so my partner and I, um, well, it's talking about the segregated system. So we didn't know if it were if we would be right after Brown v. Board yep. or right before. Yeah. Excellent so thinking, right? Something around that time. And then the language that says we believe, we were mm -hmm. thinking maybe a politician supporting one or the other side of the you know, uh, political system, maybe a you know, caucus member, something like that. Very, very smart. I'm gonna push you on a few facts because you are really on to the correct and correct answer and I'm excited about that. So, so, so Brown, around the Brown decision, because this is saying that, um, that uh, so long as there's guarantees that segregated schools get equal money, they don't think that bill or, or law should be used to end Jim Crow segregation in the schools, in the South. What kind of person, by the way, just so you know, the Brown decision, 1954, said that separate educational facilities are, and the quote was, inherently unequal. Which means, and it came from the Plessy case in the 1890s, which was on railroad cars, the Supreme Court said in the 1890s, you could have segregation as long as you give the same amount of money to both sides. And in 54, they realized, A, you never, they never get equal money, but even if they did get equal money, it would still be inherently unequal. So this quote is a defense of Plessy versus Ferguson. This is the anti-Brown decision statement. Before you knew where we were going, what kind of person would say that? Jesse Helms, Jesse Helms a classic white Southern Jim Crow segregationist racist bigot, right? So who does it have to be? Rabbi Stephen S. Wise. I got to know my God. Thank you. I'll take that. So here's, here's how the explanation, by the way, Rabbi Stephen S. Wise was the most important rabbi of his generation. He was the rabbi of the Free Synagogue of New York. There are always going to be leaders in every community that are off on extremes one way or another. This is not Rabbi Wise. He was personal friends with President Franklin D. Roosevelt and he was of the greatest stature. So now I'll tell you how it happened and, and sort of the argument that comes from it. After World War II, the United States uh, Congress and the federal government knew in the Cold War that if we were going to beat the communists, we had to strengthen education in America. And since education is supported by every state, they didn't think that the states had enough money to get the schools to train the kids to become the scientists to beat the communists. So they had a new idea that they were going to have federal aid to education. And what could be a better thing for a rabbi than to support federal aid for education? So in 1947, Rabbi Stephen S. Wise takes a train to, from New York down to DC. He sits in front of the Senate Subcommittee on Education and he gives wonderful testimony that you all should support this bill to get money to kids in schools all over the country. And he finishes his testimony and uh, a couple of white southern bigoted senators pull him aside. And they said, Rabbi, or something like that. They said, uh, there will be no federal money to go to education in the South. Because the moment you're going to put federal dollars in the South, we know the next thing you're going to do is try to undo Jim Crow segregation. So here's the deal. This bill is not going out of committee. It will never be voted on. There will not be a dollar for the children of this country for education from the federal government unless you agree to an amendment. And the amendment says, we'll give the money, but in the Deep South, the money's going to go to the white schools. And you can't use the money to, to overturn segregation. Now, what does Rabbi Stephen S. Wise do? His choice is impossible. If he agrees, to, if, he, if he disagrees with the amendment, no one's getting anything. If he agrees to the amendment so that money will go to the schools, he's selling out African Americans in the South. So this is called liberal gradualism. It means sometimes when you're trying to bring social change, you can't get all of it at once and you have to do it in pieces. So he decided it's better to get something for someone and we'll deal with the rest later. That said, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was too young in 1947 to go there. 
But just for fun, let's imagine that he made that testimony and the white Southern senators went to him and said, agree to the amendment. What do you think Dr. King would have said? No way. He would have never agreed because his whole point is trying to end Jim Crow segregation. So that's a moment as early as 1947 that the notion of white Jews and African Americans shows that there's going to be different political strategies even before the two communities came together in an alliance. So that sort of undermines the idea that the alliance was a natural one. Text seven. How's everyone doing? Like, we doing all right now? All right, so we'll have you guys do text seven. I'll read it. I am tired of the philanthropy of rich white men towards your race. I want to see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. We white men of whatever creed or faith cannot fight your battles for you. We will stand shoulder to shoulder with you until you can fight as generals all by yourselves. What was your thought process on that? Uh, we thought that it might have been a Jewish leader in the late 50s. Jewish leader in the late 50s. Excellent, correct, incorrect answer. Thank you. Why did you think that? And, and anyone, you don't have to be the only one to talk. All right, you've got three friends there. Yeah, what do you say? Um, it seems like just we were reading over the quote and we decided that it seemed like this was something you would say at the beginning of yeah. like a, a revolution, not towards yeah. the middle or the end. Right. It's got to be at the beginning. Excellent point. And by the way, we know it's a white man because he says, we white men, right? That's, a good, that, that's good to figure that part out, of whatever creed or faith cannot your, fight your own battles. This is a call for black power, right? This is a white man standing in front of a black audience saying, yeah, yeah, we're here to help you. We'll give you our money. We'll be allies with you. But let's be real, OK? We're going to stand shoulder to shoulder, but you are going to have to fight as generals all by yourselves. This is a pretty enlightened white social justice advocate who understands that whites cannot actually lead black movements for, for, for racial justice. So uh, what year was that said? You said 1959? Is that what you said? OK, so the answer is 1914. Uh, he's not. It's actually Joel Springarn. Joel Springarn was the co-founder of the NAACP. Joel, his brother Arthur, and W.B. Du Bois, the first African American to earn the PhD from Harvard, in 1909 formed the NAACP. So the one who said that was probably the most important Jewish social justice leader of his generation because he formed the NAACP. And this guy, 50 years before the rise of black power, is calling for the rise of black power. Who on planet Earth could have been surprised by the mid-1960s that the black power movement happened? So where are our brains so far? Point number one, yeah, I scrambled. <laughs> Point number one, it turns out that the Black Jewish Alliance of the 1950s wasn't anything like the literature, historical literature had said. Point number two, the rise of the Black Power Movement, the rise of Black anti-Semitism, was actually not the surprise that the literature said it was. And now we're going to get to the next part, which is turning inward. Text eight, who has that one? Please, thank you. And uh, I'll read it. Perhaps the saddest element in this whole frightening picture is in the fact that Jews are the people who are best able to understand the rhetoric of black power, even though they're most directly on the firing line of its attack. How did you think about that? Um, we didn't really know who exactly, but we right. would guess uh, Malcolm X. Malcolm X, another incredibly good correct and correct answer. Thank you very much. And it would be because uh, that would make sense. Um, it's a frightening picture. Jews are on the firing line of the attack, and, and sort of Malcolm was the chief firer of the firing line. So of course, who does it have to be? Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg, 1966. Rabbi Hertzberg, a congregational rabbi and then a Columbia University professor, author of a very important book called The Zionist Idea. And uh, let's go back to his quote. In 1966, so that's, Things are pretty miserable. By the way, black power, you know, 64, 65, it's intense. By 66, that split has happened. There is a lot of animosity between the two communities. There's a lot of Jews 
you know, running away because they're all upset about the fact that they got purged or black anti-Semitism. They're African Americans char charging Jews with racism for lots of different things. This is not a happy moment in black Jewish relations. And a rabbi says that the saddest element in the entire picture, and he says, I know it's frightening for all of you, is the fact that Jews should best understand black power. Jews should understand black power even though Jews are on the firing line of the attack of the black power ideology. This guy got it. That's my thesis for the third part of the book, by the way. That quote is the thesis. Because then I got to thinking. Maybe Jewish leaders understood black power. Maybe they emulated black power. Maybe they looked for ways that uh, they could turn black power into something Jewish. So uh, who has text nine? Okay, all the way on the way back, I'll read it and then talk to us about it. The positive um, aspect of black power is its search for ethnic identity. This we should be able to understand and approve. The American black today is in this respect precisely, retracing precisely the experience of American Jews a generation or two ago. So what did, what did you think about that? Uh, we thought maybe it was a rabbi or a historian speaking about the 60s or... Maybe he was talking about it in the 70s. Nice. That, so that is the correct, correct answer. Uh, well done. It's Rabbi Roland Gittleson in 1969. And this is what's important about Rabbi Gittleson. All right, I'll tell you first. Very old white man in 1969. We'll start there with Rabbi Roland Gittleson, Temple Israel of Boston. And this is important because this grandpa is saying that the po that's a positive aspect of, of blacks looking for ethnic identity, that Jews should understand it, Jews should approve it, and that African Americans are doing what Jews had been doing earlier in history. And this is why it's important. Rabbi Gittleson in 1947 was uh, nominated by Pre President Harry S. Truman to be on his White House Civil Rights Commission. This guy was one of the earliest Jewish social justice folk. And then in the 50s, it was his congregants who went down to the south to Mississippi to register voters that got arrested, that got sent to Parchman. And in the 60s, if there's anybody who didn't like black power because the charge about black power is it was against Dr. King's vision of an interracial alliance, Rabbi Gittleson would be the first one you would have to nominate for opposing black power. And if you read the earlier historical literature and believed it at face value, he must oppose black power because black power according to this Jewish argument, went against Dr. King. There's been a lot of arguments in African-American history that he didn't, but that would be it. So when I'm reading that Gittleson is not only supporting black power, but is in fact uh, saying that that is something that Jews themselves had experienced, uh, I'm rather impressed. Who has text 10? Yes. Well, I, I oh, so the question is, what ethnic group benefit most from affirmative action programs in the 1960s? Yeah, I'll repeat it. In, yeah. In business, All right. So the Even question. Jews. Yeah. So who benefit most from affirmative action? The answer was Jews because there had been quotas against Jews, um, and that was problematic. So I'll give you a historical fact just to change your answer, and the historical fact is, the affirmative action programs of the 1960s under President Lyndon Johnson's Great Society did not include Jews as a designated minority group which means Jews had achieved whiteness by the mid-1960s, so the federal government did not extend affirmative action to Jews. So if Jews did not qualify for affirmative action, who would have been the biggest beneficiary of affirmative action? Blacks, right? Which means that the correct answer is Jews. Thank you for following along. But wait, how could it be? Well, Jews were not a designated minority, but women were. Women were a designated minority for affirmative action. And Jewish, white Jewish women were very well prepared to take advantage of the opportunities of affirmative action because they were ready to go to college, to grad school, to get jobs in, in the professions. So, so here's what happened. When they do the data on affirmative action in the 60s, Jewish women end up number one. So we can say, as you correctly said, Jews benefit more than any other group in affirmative action. So if there is a Jewish argument against affirmative action, whatever that argument is, 
It's gendered, which is a nice way of saying it's sexist and misogynist, because you can't say affirmative action was bad for the Jews unless you get rid and make invisible half the Jewish population and only talk about Jewish men. So I looked in the literature. I only found two references in all of the written literature, even the journalistic literature, that gave a gendered assessment of affirmative action in order to show um, that, uh, that, in fact, uh, Jews benefit. So here's part three. In an earlier book, I'm studying the freedom rides. The freedom rides, the famous interracial buses that cross state lines to test complicity with the federal laws. It was an incredible action and lots of violence. It was, and when I'm pulling up in the archives, it says 1974 for the Freedom Ride. Clearly, whoever was typing the card got their hands on the wrong numbers because the Freedom Ride's from more of the early 60s. They weren't 1974. So I pulled out the folder in the archives. It said 74. I pulled out the sheet of papers in there, and it turns out it was a Freedom Ride for Soviet Jews. The Soviet Jewry movement actually grew out of the Black Power movement because if you were Jewish and, uh, and, and you were involved in civil rights and then black power rises and says, guess what, you know, white Jews, you can't be in leadership. And they're like, well, what, do you want, what should we do? They're like, go into your own community. Malcolm X has a famous quote. Go into your own community and lead. And so they say, all right, well, Jews in America don't need civil rights. They're doing pretty well. Let's make a civil rights movement for Soviet Jews. And they start taking to the streets by the tens of thousands that are protesting. One third of the Soviet Jewry activists were trained in the civil rights movement. Um, the, the leader of the student struggle for Soviet Jewry said, if injustice cannot be condoned in Selma, USA, neither can it be allowed in um, Kiev, USSR. Uh, so I am arguing that the rise of the Soviet Jewry movement is in thanks and appreciation to, uh, to black power. Um, I only put that up because that's actually my synagogue up north. So my rabbi saw this, so I put this in for her. Um, Zionism. In 1948, um, when Israel was created, American Jews were relieved and happy, but they were not dancing in the streets. In 1967, when Israel won the Six-Day War, the reaction of, of American Jews was incredible. All right, there was a Gallup poll done of American Jews, 97% said they had strong sympathy for Israel. Can you imagine 97% of the American Jewish com community today offering strong sympathy for Israel? They had, they had a luncheon in New York City. In one hour, they raised $18 million for Israel. That's 1967 dollars. I don't know the math to figure out what it'd be today. The uh, Jewish community of the United States doubled its giving in one year. 7,500 Jewish college students called their moms and had them send them their passports and they got on planes and went to Israel. And the University of California created the Education Abroad Program at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem as a consequence of 1967. So my argument is the reason Jews responded so well in 67 to Zionism was because the black nationalist movement created in America, the idea that every ethnic racial group can advocate for itself and be nationalistic and be proud of it and be in the streets and not worry about you know, what, what people are going to think about it. So that says an American hippie in Israel. Turns out all these like, well, this is my alma mater and Rabbi Goodman said Berkeley. They, they go to the Hebrew University for junior year abroad from, from Cal Berkeley. And uh, they've got the They've got the bell-bottom jeans, and they got the beads, and they're smoking marijuana, and they got the hair everywhere, and they're coming home. They're coming home to Israel because they're feeling Jewish, thanks to black power. And they land, and they show up in the dorms of the Hebrew University, and the Israeli students look at them and that they're freaks because they just got out of the military. They're clean cut. They're the intellectual elite of the state of Israel. And when they look at these American hippies in Israel, I would like to say to those American hippies, you thought you were being Jewish when you got on the plane to Israel. But when you landed, you were pretty darn American because those Israelis were seeing the fact that your Jewishness is actually constructed more by Americanness. Um, it worked in reverse um, as well. Um, 
This is Rabbi Dove Peretz Elkins, um, who was actually my rabbi for the year that we spent in, in Princeton. And he argued in the late 60s, black power is nothing more and nothing less than Negro Zionism. So now it's going back and forth, right? Not only are Jews borrowing from black power, but it's the other way. Uh, this is Rabbi Hertzberg, our favorite guy from that earlier quote. He said, Stokely Carmichael, who is a leader of, of black power, was the most radical kind of Negro Zionist. He talks exactly the language of those Jews who felt most violently angry at the sight of Hitler and most hurt by the good people who stood aside. Rabbi Gittleson, in one of his sermons, said the black power advocate is the Negro's Zionism. Africa is his Israel. Chad Polier, you saw him earlier. Here he is with Dr. King. He said to the British, all right, so by the way, there was a, a Jewish Israeli military force called the Stern Gang which some charged with being a right-wing terrorist military group. All right, so to say that, it was Shad Paulier of the leftist American Jewish Congress who said, to the British people, the Stern Gang in Israel was no less extreme than the black nationalists, the so-called Muslim movement in the eyes of the American people. Ben Halpern, another scholar, said black power's fundamental meaning is quite clear. It means exactly the same as the equally vague term of auto-emancipation, which is what Jewish nationalism began in the 1880s. They are celebrating black power. They are linking it back and forth across the two communities, even at a time that these communities aren't talking to one another. So, uh, so then, I, I hate this musical. This is Fiddler on the Roof. It's my least favorite because I'm a scholar of American Jewish history. We'll talk about that later. But I put it up there because something else happened to American Jews after black power. They became more traditional in their Judaism. Many of the kids became kosher, and they wouldn't go to their parents' house anymore because it wasn't kosher or kosher enough for them to eat. They now began wearing Jewish clothing in public. They read Jewish books. They self-educated. So the easy question... So there's a, Jew, a big Jewish um, a publisher. It's called the Jewish Publication Society. It's in Philadelphia. The number one most popular book that they published was the Hebrew Bible, as you would think. The real question then is, what was the second most popular book they published? The Jewish Catalog. The Jewish Catalog, did you say? <laughs> Excellent. Yes, well done. My Bible. That was your Bible. All right, so now we have a primary source right here. I'll catch up the rest of you. The Jewish catalog is how to be Jewish with macrame. Yes, it was a do-it-yourself arts and crafts book, each chapter telling you how to knit your own kippah or make your own prayer shawl talit or bake the challah for Friday night and braid it appropriately. And they sold so many copies. It was based on the whole earth catalog is where it came from. Why are Jewish kids at that time buying the Jewish catalog? A. They're interested in being more Jewish. B, they don't know how to be Jewish because they were raised in the 50s when their parents tried to assimilate. Three, they're hippies, so you got to do it like arts and crafts because that's how they like it. That was the perfect combination after black power to elevate Jewish education. The, the book was so popular that they had the Jewish catalog two, the sequel. They had the Jewish catalog three. They had the Jewish kids catalog but they did not have the Jewish catalog for. Because by the time all those years passed, the, parent, the ones who bought the first one, they had kids, and they sent them to Sunday school, religious school, Jewish day camp, Jewish day school. So they didn't need no Jewish catalog for to learn it, because it turns out you, you educated them, right? So, um, so we, we have uh, Black Power to thank uh, for that. And uh, there we go. OK, student, yeah. Oh, students. Leftist Jewish students. Um, this is a group up in San Francisco. It's actually a friend of mine in there. That's why I put that in to, to, to honor her. So young Jews got really mad at their parents because their parents, they said, were just rich, donating money to Jewish causes for status, but they weren't actually interested in Jewish education, Jewish religion, or Jewish practice. So in San Francisco at the Jewish Community Federation, which is like the big Jewish fundraising arm, they did not have a sit-in they had a pray in. And they went on Friday evening, the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath, and they sat occupying the halls of the Jewish Community Federation, and they lit candles, 
and they said the blessings, and they prayed, and they danced, and they wouldn't leave until the Federation promised to start giving more money to Jewish education. So that is the civil rights movement protest combined with a heightened Jewish religiosity, and then they were able to do that. Um, also, Jewish militancy. There were some who took the black power movement and went to the political right instead of the political left. The Jewish Defense League, in fact, created paramilitary groups to go in Jewish neighborhoods to protect Jews in neighborhoods that were changing to African-American neighborhoods. The leader of that organization, Mayor Kahani, uh, and his successors were designated by the FBI as domestic terrorists. They were racists. And if you interviewed Mayor Kahani, he would tell you he got his inspiration from Black Power, or actually from the Black Panthers in Oakland, more specifically. He said if the Black Panthers in Oakland are organizing and marching and have their weapons to protect themselves, Jews should do the same thing, especially uh, after the Holocaust. So, so now, our big question. Oh, there's a JDL. Yes, the letter Z. That is my depiction of the new historiographic school, and this is how it goes. Okay, work with me on this, because we had X and Y. I figured I want to make Z work. Somebody suggested I use H, and I said, that doesn't work, X, Y, H. All right. So at the beginning, blacks and Jews were together, marching along together. Isn't it great? Oh, no, black power. They go back in reverse. But after the mid-1960s, blacks and Jews both embraced black power in a parallel way in their own communities and have a new consensus even though it looks very different than the old consensus that they had. Does that work visually? All right, thank you. Oh, it gets, well, depressing for me for a little bit, but then it gets exciting again. So let me pause for a moment. Do you see that this is a new historiographic school, that this is a challenge to the way in which <coughs> the, the literature and, um, and really American Jews excuse me a moment, have come to understand uh, the, black, the black Jewish relationship. Well, <clears throat> how much time do I have before, well, thank you, no, no, I'm thinking, I'm thinking historiographically how much time do I have, thank you, I appreciate that, before some grad student's going to read this book and decide I'm an idiot because I've totally missed the point and they're going to write the next version that they'll come and talk to your kids about when they come to UC Santa Barbara. So I said, i got to get ahead of it. So I wrote an epilogue. And here's the epilogue. All right. Fifty years after Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel did that famous march from Selma, which showed you at the beginning, the reform movement of Judaism and the NAACP decided to recreate the march. And uh, I do not mean to pick out these particular, this particular rabbi. I just mean to say that uh, on Facebook, well, 200 rabbis went to Selma, between Selma and DC, to march for voters' rights. So that's, that's a nice thing to do. But uh, well, I sat with a woman named Ilana Kaufman, an African-American Jewish woman friend of mine. And I was all excited about this. She was not so excited about this. So she started telling me from a Jew of color perspective, you know, what was going on. And, uh, and all right, look at the picture, right? I'm just afraid this rabbi and all the rabbis, 200 of them, are going to come back to their congregations thinking that they're Rabbi Heschel, that they're heroes, that they have marched for civil rights. When in fact, if they did that, it would be horrible because what they should do is go and start marching and start getting a little bit of consciousness about what institutional racism and white supremacy looks like, and they should come back to their congregations and go, oh my God, I, I, w the work hasn't even begun. We have to get started on it, right? So I was kind of afraid that this image portended that. And as Alana said, where am I in that picture? I wrote a whole book on the black-Jewish relationship. My interest was how much of Jewishness is actually Americanness that Jews don't realize is Americanness, which is really blackness, if you think about the black power movement. So I'm going between you know, those two things. And Alana is looking at this and saying, I wonder how much Jewishness is really whiteness. 
because you just wrote a book on black Jewish relations. A lot of can't be in that book, unless we're relating to her and the 10% of American Jews, or well, 20% I identify as ethnically diverse, about 10% uh, as African American Jews. And, and, and her point is, uh, how, how could it be that Jewishness isn't actually whiteness? And you need to write a book about the relationship to black and Jews that has nothing to do with the relationship at all, because it's from the perspective of somebody who's holding both simultaneously. And I went, oh, you're right. OK, she has to write the next book, right? Now we have to have a book written by someone from the, from the Jews of color uh, community in order to see. So it looked on the surface like there was a whole lot of political change that occurred in the mid-1960s. In fact, it didn't. There was a new consensus. Oh, if I could ever go with Stokely. There was a new consensus that was achieved uh, in the mid 60s and the late 1960s, uh, which meant that American Jews were becoming a whole lot more American and a whole lot more black power than they ever imagined. Thank you very much. Um. Thank you very much, Mark. This was a very enlightening presentation. Before we enter into discussion with you with some questions, I'd like to introduce you to someone who's very, very special, my colleague in black studies, uh, Professor Jeffrey Stewart. And the reason that I um, invited him here is because his book, which is an extraordinary book, it's a very large book, it's entitled um, The New on lock. You can't see it. Well, it's right here. It's quite large. And um, this book was just awarded the National Book Award for Biography. And I believe, let's, uh, let's give Jeffrey a hand. Um, so Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey was at an event for, at the university that was uh, uh, lauding and praising him for this extraordinary book. And so I really wanted him to be here. He was sort of caught up in traffic and uh, the darkness here around where, where, where this is. And um, maybe, uh, Jeffrey, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you like to comment about what you heard from uh, Mark Dollinger? And I'll give you the mic. So we're going to hear from Professor Jeffrey Stewart, the winner of the uh, National Book, Book Award in biography. Thank you very much. Sorry to barge in on your... Uh, I was just going to say, I think this is a fascinating uh, revisionist uh, uh, look at the 60s, and uh, I'm surprised you haven't gotten into more trouble about it. Because <laughs> usually when you come with these paradigm-breaking uh, theses, you know, there's some pushback. Um, one of the things, though, that I'd say I wasn't, you know, I hadn't heard it with the depth of primary source work. That's the thing that I think is really striking about this, uh, to really see what people say rather than what people say about what they said, yeah, yeah. which is what you, you talk about in the introduction uh, to the book. But I, my book on Locke, um, uh, Alan Locke was uh, friends with uh, Horace Callan. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he was a uh, philosopher and he credits himself uh, as being kind of the first person for sort of secular Zionism. Right. And uh, he and Locke were at uh, Oxford University in, the in 1907, and Locke was the first black Rhodes Scholar. And he went over there, and he thought he was going to escape American racism, and he ran into more of it than he'd ever experienced, primarily from Southern wrote scholars, and it was Callan, who was Jewish, who basically bonded with him and talked about nationalism. And it was Callan who basically convinced Locke, pretty much, that rather than trying to assimilate into American uh, culture, that African Americans should essentially uh, develop a sense of what they call the right to be different. And that sort of became the basis of their shared notion of cultural pluralism, you know, that you could be American, but you had the right to have your own culture. And I sort of see that as a forerunner, a kind of nationalist forerunner uh, of this. 
um, that you're talking about, and that was 1907, 1910. Yeah. Uh, my book also shows the kind of tensions that go on between black and white and, and black and Jewish intellectuals uh, in the 30s uh, with the socialist movement, the communist movement, and but also that you know significant numbers of uh, Jewish uh, immigrants uh, coming over during the 30s taught at black universities or black mm -hmm. historically black uh, colleges and universities and you know promoted the idea that African Americans could and should do art and culture about the African American experience. So that's been a fairly yeah. consistent yeah. Uh, um, a pattern and integrationism is something that everyone kind of always wanted. Uh, Horace Callan couldn't teach at uh, Harvard even though he was the uh, heir apparent of William James because he was Jewish. So, um, you know, it's not really surprising to me, but I think the explicitness <laughs> that you see in these texts is just remarkable uh, that uh, people. Uh, and I think that, you know, it just shows you that there was no overarching ideology of collaboration between the groups. I mean, it was there at times, particularly during the 30s, I think. You know, we always talk a lot about <coughs> Marxism and how bad it is and everything. But, in fact, Marxism did create a moment of uh, the 30s of, of, of black Jewish alliance around class struggle. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the ethnic particularism always was a was was a, a, a factor, and it's 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 kind of tragic in a sense because we're now in a situation where there's so much tension uh, between black and Jewish communities. At least I sense there is, uh, and there's such an assault coming from uh, right wing uh, ideologies. Um, you know, Charlottesville. Uh, the attacking of black churches, the attacking of synagogues. I mean, we're seeing that, I think we're now in a moment of the response by some people to this alliance. I mean, it's almost like, if I can use this term, which is a little, you know, kind of 60s, the enemy has seen the potential f for this alliance. And it's not waiting, you know, for it to, for it to be, you know, reconfigured. So. That's the thing that I see right now is that this narrative that you're attacking that the black power movement is the reason for why the Martin Luther King, we're all together, Jews within it, didn't flourish, I think is an important thing to do to take off and say, okay, you know, it wasn't some betrayal that black intellectuals or leaders had of integration and of Jewish supporters. Because I think that's really a big part of the 60s, uh, post-60s narrative uh, that's you shown to be untrue. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. OK, we have some time for questions or comments. Who wants to start? And all I'll say is please form your question in the form of a question. Thank you. Okay, we have a question right here. So would you comment on the seeming split in the uh, Women's March movement and the charges of anti-Semitism? Yeah. <laughs> so I always say I'm an historian. It's tough enough to predict the past because usually my first question has to do with the, con the contemporary or future. Uh, so if, if you're not following it, um, there, there is now charges of anti-Semitism among the leadership in the women's movement because of associations with Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam. So I think what my research is demonstrating is that the Nation of Islam and Farrakhan and his predecessors are, are, are not static symbols that represent the same thing to Jews all the time. Isn't it interesting that in the 1950s, National Jewish leaders from the ADL did not have a problem with what the Nation of Islam is doing, but now there's a huge issue that's going on which to me means this is more about changes in the American Jewish community than it is changes in the Nation of Islam or in its leadership. Ultimately, what's happening here is we're having a split where um, 
where, where, where Jews who have moved into whiteness and power and privilege are quite concerned about an association of some leaders with someone who is anti-Semitic and their demands being made by some in the Jewish community that the leaders of the march formally repudiate Louis Farrakhan or the Jews are gonna take their ball and go home and leave the particular movement. Um, there are many Jews, mostly on the progressive left, who are uh, far more understanding that life is complicated, people are complicated, Farrakhan is complicated, and if you're interested in, in the Women's March, in this case, in, in, in ending sexism and misogyny, then sometimes you're gonna to have to have political alliances with people with whom you have disagreements. That's what's called life. And um, in fact, if you inverted it and looked in the civil rights movement, the number of times that African-American civil rights workers had to deal with even well-meaning white liberals who end up being racist, maybe without even realizing it, then we understand that to have the power to say we're gonna walk away is itself a reflection of the ascension of Jews into power um, and is a departure from what the alliance is, which is coming together under very complicated and problematic uh, terms. Uh, another question? There's someone in the back there. All right, I don't uh, know if you can see. Should I see uh, all, all the way in the back in the okay. corner. Uh, how do you explain the uh, apparent passivity of Jews in general, um, particularly from your university, which is one of the most anti-Jewish, racist universities in the world, namely San Francisco State? Um, and how do you explain the, the lack of Jewish um, um, calling out of you know, someone like a Louis Farrakhan, who is not complicated, he is simply a black, Islamist racist pig. And, and yet Jews will not form that in language which is very clear. The Tamika Mallory's of the world, the Linus Asur's of the world, the apologists for these racists um, are simply left to um, speak their poison. Uh, How do you I explain just, that? I do. I disagree with the presumption um, in that what we have in this case is actually a split among many uh, segmented groups of the American Jewish community because we, are, we run the gamut from, from those who, are, who are, are articulating what you are and want an instant uh, out, and then those who are actually staying in for a variety of reasons. For my particular university, I actually disagree. Um, we've been involved for the last three years in um, a, a high profile case of fighting campus anti-Semitism, uh, and in fact, um, there was a federal complaint in court, there was a state complaint filed in court, we, it's a court date, up for early March. So uh, I can tell you my last three years have been fully engaged with lots of other people who are around. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I think we have time for one more question, which is in the back here. I'm gonna bring this around for you. Yeah, thank you for that reference. That's, I like that. Thank you, um, and I appreciate that. And in fact, that's four paragraphs in my introduction. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, and and what, what happens in the introduction is, is, is I, I map out that there were in fact about a half a dozen different versions, right? Mecha, the Latino um, uh, movement uh, after the Seattle Seven were, were arrested. AIM, the American Indian movement, at one point takes over Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay for close to a year. And, and what I wrote in the introduction is, I, I think anecdotally that the black power movement actually energized all of these different ethnic racial gender groups and feminism as well, which doesn't emerge until the early 70s. In fact, a famous, infamous, and maybe it's not actually a true story, you know, that, the, that second wave feminism occurred when Stokely Carmichael told a journalist who 
because they were criticizing the way in which SNCC was, was, was handling women. What's the proper position of women in your organization? And he supposedly said prone. I'm not sure. I've also heard that he didn't actually say that. But that at that point, yes. black women actually went to create second wave feminism. So what, what, what I offered in the introduction was, uh, I'm trained in American Jewish history, so I'm going to do the Jewish one. I'll write the Jewish, the black power Jewish book, and then I invited my colleagues who are in other ethnic studies disciplines to see the extent to which they might find a similar story with their particular groups. Based upon the chronology, I, I really think black power was, was the agent or the engine that informed the other groups. You know, Mark, this has been an extraordinary evening with you, and indeed day, uh, because you were with us at lunch for a special seminar. Um, I'd like to thank you. And I want to encourage you to buy this book. Uh, our friends from Chaucer's are out there. And if you buy the book, um, Mark is going to stay around and sign it. It's a very important book because it gives us a kind of window onto the 1960s, which was a critical decade for American Jewry. And Mark Dollinger really pulls it apart and puts it back together for us in ways that are truly surprising and um, a real example of original research. So don't miss this book for your Jewish Studies library. And let's thank Mark Nollinger for his presentation this evening. Thank you. I, I appreciate it.